welcome everybody. We're excited to have uh, this professionalization workshop. This is going to be, I think, one of the better ones that we've uh, done. Rather than having our faculty blather on about what we do or more likely don't know about applying anthropology beyond the academy, we have three uh, legit professionals who are uh, amazing on both academic and applied fronts, and we're, we're really excited. <clears throat> so just to briefly introduce our panel, uh, we have um, Nicole Matheny Huddleston, um, who is a senior qualitative research consultant at Elite Research, as well as a qualitative research consultant at Texas Women's University. So uh, Nikki worked for five years at Mercer prior to her uh, current position. She has a master's degree from the University of North Texas, uh, which is one of the programs uh, that we've uh, we recommend to students who are potentially looking to do a degree in applied anthropology. And she has a bachelor's degree in sociocultural anthropology from none other than our own department. Uh, you may see a trend here that um, uh, we actually chose some of our friends for this panel. So Nikki and I were actually students with John Hawkins uh, doing field school as undergraduates in Guatemala. Uh, gosh, uh, just short of 20, maybe about 18 years ago, I think it was. Um, and uh, so we're excited to have uh, Nikki here. We also have Dr. Amy Sousa, who's a principal uh, UX research lead at Microsoft. Prior to that, she's uh, spent several years at the Hartman Group, and she also does a lot of nonprofit work with an organization called Pro Project Feast, which we'll let you decide if you're going to tell us about that. She has a PhD from the University of Chicago in the Department of Comparative Human Development, which coincidentally, Greg Thompson and I both have degrees from, and uh, Charles Knuckles, we claim him as an alumnus, although technically he was, his degree was in Committee on South Asian Studies. But either way, um, just to give you a sense of her research, her dissertation was Pragmatic Ethics and Sensible Care, Psychiatry, Schizophrenia, and Recovery in North India. So kind of clinical ethnography in India. And she also had a bachelor's degree from um, in anthropology from New York University. And then our third panelist is Dr. Michael Claddock, who's a senior research scientist at Clinical Outcome Solutions. Um, he's also, if you, uh, all of the anthropology students, I'm guessing have at some point read an article from the journal How. He was one of the original crew that really got that, uh, that project up and going. Um, and uh, also a PhD and master's degrees from the University of Chicago, also from a little known department called the Department of Comparative Human Development. So, um, and to give you a sense of his research, uh, his thesis was making entitled Making Monks, Making Men, the Role of Buddhist Monasticism in Shaping Northern Thai Identities. And, and Michael also has a BA in, uh, from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, at, uh, in psychology and mathematics. So um, we're just excited to have uh, all the three of you here uh, to give everybody a sense of the format. So what we're gonna do is we're going to give each of our panelists 10 to 15 minutes uh, to make comments um, and to, uh, we, we basically just ask them to sort of give us some perspective on uh, a range of things and in, including but not limited to being an anthropologist uh, in the real world and how anthropological training and insight factors into their work and, and maybe just give us a brief description of what work they do. I mean, it's, it's worth noting as a preface that the majority of uh, even PhDs in anthropology do not go into academia in, in the US, right? So um, the part of this panel is to give our students some perspective as well as some, um, um, some uh, insight into sort of what uh, anthropology means to the, the broader world outside the academy and, and how it's valued and so on. So um, uh, I, let's, let's, let's maybe actually s uh, switch up the order a little bit because Amy does have to uh, sign off right at um, 
uh, one o'clock our local time, 12 o'clock her time. So let's start with Nikki and then Michael and then Amy, and then maybe we can take the questions. So we're, each of them is gonna present for about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and then we're gonna open up to a QA. and a And so maybe Amy will have you go last so that we can maybe entertain questions directly related to anything you said, and then move to a, a broader thing before you sign up. Is that okay? So, so I'll turn if, to you. If, sorry, if I go last, I think, won't I not have time? Uh, if we stick, uh, doing the math here. Cause I have to leave in 50 close. minutes. Um, sure. Let, uh, Does that make sense? Cause if, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe so let's do the opposite. <laughs> let's do the opposite then. Let's start with you. You're talking, so you're unmuted. So let's start with you. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's fine. Let's, that's let's totally go fine. Amy, Nikki, Michael. Okay. Okay. All right. That all sounds yours. great. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Jacob. And I just wanna say I'm so happy to be here and then to also see you, Jacob, as well as Greg and Michael, because we were all together in um, the University of Chicago, as Jacob mentioned, and it's just a nice blast from the past. So thanks for, uh, it makes me so happy to see, see your faces. Um, so as Jacob mentioned, I'm a principal user research manager at Microsoft. Um, I graduated with Jacob in 2011 and took what then in our program seemed and felt like the unconventional path of working in industry instead of in academia. Uh, but as, Jason, uh, as Jacob mentioned, most anthropologists do work in industry. So what I'm gonna do over the next 10 to 15 minutes is talk a bit more about my career trajectory and what that looked like. I'll talk about my role at Microsoft and what I'm doing there and how having a social scientific anthropological perspective really does add a unique value. Um, and also talk about what, what we look for when we're, we are building our teams, the types of skills um, and experiences we look for. I'm a hiring manager. I've been on numerous interview loops across the company. So I have a lot of perspective on that. And I wanna leave plenty of time to answer your questions, especially any specific questions you have about um, you know, the types of research methods we do, what it, if you are interested in working at a company like Microsoft, what the steps you need to take are, so all of that. So to get started, um, as Jacob mentioned, I, work at, I worked at a place called the Hartman Group, and that was my first foray into industry. It was a small consulting firm that specifically recruited people with advanced degrees in anthropology. Um, in fact, that was really one of their selling points. They wanted to, you know, we worked with huge consumer packaged good companies, the likes of General Mills and Kraft and Coca-Cola. And they, their goal, their value proposition was to bring this ethnographic way of knowing and seeing to advise these large, primarily food companies on health and wellness trends and what the anthropologists lended to this and the ethnographic methods was really going into people's homes, spending time with them, shopping with them, um, just being with them and understanding how Americans eat, think about food and conceptualize their health. So I found that in that first job, it was really hard at first to take my knowledge and put it in that applied setting. But once it clicked, I could see immediately the value it added because I was able to sort of contextualize these patterns in American culture, in human behavior within these contexts of these larger socioeconomic realities and help them develop different um, you know, world models we talked about of how different types of people who live in different areas, come from different backgrounds, have different belief systems, eat differently, and you know, have different ideas about what it means to be healthy, and then translate all that into you know, what new flavor of cereal <laughs> should General Mills de develop to you know, 
uh, sell to this particular audience type. So it was a great opportunity for me to kind of cut my teeth doing anthropology in an applied setting. And it also really provided me with the requisite experience to then be hired at Microsoft. So that's a big, um, a big important thing. Most of the people that we do hire at Microsoft who have anthropology backgrounds, we are looking for at least some applied experience. It's rare, unless it's an intern program, that we would bring on someone who doesn't, but there's so many places to get that experience um, and to translate it over, and we can talk more about that later. So in, I did that for uh, a few years, and then in 2015, I joined Microsoft. I started at Microsoft in hardware, which was really interesting because I was building consumer electronics. So working in what is called the Surface uh, brand of hardware at Microsoft, building tablets, laptops, um, I did a lot of work on digital inking and this new device, which just came to market called the Surface Duo, which is a foldable device. And this was really fun because I went out in the world and I really studied in close detail with the patience of an anthropologist, how people hold devices, interact with devices, uh, you know, type, click on things, measuring things like the force at which people hold a device, how they use their devices on buses and trains in all of that. Um, so that was really, really interesting. And again, it was this anthropological perspective of observing behavior, being very meticulous and taking notes, and then translating all of that into real insight that could help the engineering teams I worked so closely with, you know, develop specs for products that then came off, a, you know, a, a factory line in uh, China. And then seeing those products in the real world was pretty amazing on the shelves, the shelves of stores. Um, so I did that for a while and I really, really loved it. But I moved um, to a different team, which is where I am now. And it's quite different. And actually, this is another really exciting thing. When you're working at a larger company as an anthropologist, you have the opportunity to have many different careers within that one place. So I now I join this team where we, where we work on what's called the employee experience. So I lead a team of researchers working on the employee experience. And what that means is we actually study how employees interni internal to Microsoft work. We study their workflows, how they move between different tools, how they, organize their day, how they start their day, how they interact with technologies, how they um, you know, struggle their pain points as they try to move between all these different tools our employees at Microsoft have to use to get their jobs done. And then we step back, we take that data and we work to improve those experiences in a meaningful way to really empower our employees to do their best work and to do their most creative work as well. So I work with a um, team of researchers and designers. We're a studio of about 80 researchers and designers. So we actually use that data and design these experiences and then work with engineering teams to implement them, ship them, bring them to life. Um, so this work is very uh, relevant to my background in training, primarily because it is really in support of these two company-wide Microsoft initiatives right now that we talk that are happening right now that we talk about in terms of digital transformation and cultural transformation. So when we talk about digital transformation at Microsoft, we really see this as I guess it would be our fourth industrial revolution. So we think about okay, we had steam in the 18th century, then we had electricity in the 19th century. We saw this boom in the late 20th century in the 1970s really with electronics and IT uh, coming to the forefront with the computer. But then beginning in 2015, it's the digital revolution. And this is what we're seeing now as we transform how technology works. 
through cloud computing, artificial intelligence, modern workplace, which is really about shaping and defining the workplace of the future through technology to change how we interact and collaborate. So all of these things are incredibly important and we need to, as a team, help lead that digital transformation within Microsoft for our own employees. So we're kind of part of that and then, you know, it's a, it's a lot of hard work, but it's also a lot of fun. Um, and you can begin to see how this kind of having a unique social scientific perspective can really lend um, insight to a lot of these bigger questions. So when I step back and I think about my role at Microsoft, you know, working as an anthropo anthropologist in technology, I really see myself just focusing on this constant interplay of technology, culture, society. How does it come together? Because it's never, when we think again, back to digital transformation, cloud, AI, internet of things, all that stuff, it's never just about the technology. It's about the human, right? Because with all of this, there are moral questions, there are ethical questions, there are social questions, there are huge trust issues, there's security questions. If we just focus on the technology, without seeing that, you know, the much wider sphere of influence that needs to be accounted for in the building of that technology, we will fail, our tech, you know, nothing will be adopted, our solutions won't be used, will be irrelevant. So one of my biggest jobs is to really influence engineers and product managers to shift away from this technology first mindset to a human first mindset. And so I spend a lot of time with that and my team, which is interdisciplinary. We have psychologists, folks with human um, computer interaction design. We have, who else do we have? Um, sociologists, clinical psychologists, as well as people with the range of, um, you know, more like data backgrounds as well, because we do a lot of quant research. So it's this really interesting and unique group of people all coming together to in answer these questions. So I think I might have talked for 10 minutes. I'm not sure. But do people want to ask questions or should I continue? Uh, let's let, let if you have a couple more thoughts, uh, why don't you go ahead and kind of finish out what you'd like to say? I think we're probably best off if we get through three panelists and then kind of open up to questions. Yeah. I have asked students, uh, if you'd like to pose a question while the speakers are speaking, please do that in the chat. So, Got it. Go oh, I see we're doing all the questions at once at the end. Okay, yeah. So um, as I mentioned, just to wrap up, we have a team of interdisciplinary researchers, but it's not just about education. It is true, most of the folks we hire have advanced degrees, either an MA or a PhD. Uh, and of course, depending on, of course, you need experience, but what we're also really looking for is diversity of thought, perspective, the willingness to learn, agility. We know very well that diverse teams are high performing teams that build the best products for our employees and customers. So increasingly, as part of our cultural transformation, you know, adopting this growth mindset, uh, we're open to um, just different backgrounds and different ways of seeing and knowing. So I think as a hiring manager, that's something I bring to the team as well, because I'm quite passionate about that. Can I ask a quick question, Jacob, for Amy, since she, she won't be here at the end, right? Yes, you can ask me. Go, okay. go ahead, Greg. Uh, hey, Amy, nice to see you. Hi, it's nice uh, to see you. I just had a, um, could you give an example, uh, maybe a brief example of a project that you've worked on where, and if you have any example of where the anthropology or sort of the anthropological insight came in particularly handy, like uh, sure. some specifics, you know? Yeah, sure. So um, it's always hard because a lot of what we do is rather, um, you know, confidential, but definitely for, um, some work that we're doing right now, we're working with sellers in the sales space. And we know that 
these salespeople who make up a huge proportion of the population at Microsoft have a really hard time doing their jobs. Um, and as a business, the uh, solution tend to be just coming up with new tools for them to use to manage their leads, their opportunities, their quotas, all of this stuff. So, but the same problems had persisted. Really, you can look back at data from 10 years ago. So what we did was we went in and actually spent time watching, observing, sitting with them pre-COVID, understanding how they structure their workflows in mapping out all of their patterns through um, you know, deep qualitative research and insight. And then from there, basically analyzing all of that um, into a set of key themes, which we could bring back to the business as the top you know, pain points that we need to address, everything from how many tools they were using to the major you know, hassles and pitfalls, and then actually work with the team to translate all of that into um, a really a, pr a product roadmap essentially for getting, you know, getting rid of some of the tools and then building new tools. And then once we start building new tools, that's when the work gets a lot more iterative and you go back to those same people with the prototypes of the various tools you're creating and again, sit with them and test and observe and watch over and over again how they're using them. I don't know if that's helpful, but. Yeah. That's great. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Amy. I think we'll move on to our next panelist and uh, we'll hopefully we'll get back to some of the uh, Q&A before we have to sign off. Uh, but let's go ahead and turn it over to uh, uh, Nikki, Nicole, Matheny, Huddleston. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jacob. And thanks so much for inviting me to participate. I'm thrilled to be back um, kind of virtually at my alma mater. I had a lot of really wonderful experiences um, in the anthropology department at BYU. Um, so just a little bit about what I do. Um, I, as Jacob had mentioned, I did work at a large consulting firm called Mercer for the first five years of my career. And quite honestly, it was um, quite a jump for me because I, I knew that I always wanted to apply anthropology um, to solve social problems, but I was more oriented toward solving kind of what I, in my mind at the time, considered more noble problems, like, you know, some kind of health problems or community development or something like that. And what I found when I first graduated with, uh, from grad school is that there weren't a whole lot of jobs out there that had applied anthropologists in the title and, you know, it wasn't as easy and obvious for me to find a job that I was really looking for, especially with very little experience. And so I found myself with this um, job at Mercer, this very, very large international consulting firm. And I was very much a fish out of water for a little while because um, I went from much a much more academically oriented kind of community development oriented focus to very corporate. Um, so that took some time. And um, something that helped me was I kind of took it um, with the perspective of an anthropologist and I tried to learn what is the culture here? What is the corporate culture that I'm seeing? And that helped me a little bit to look at, look at it from that perspective. Eventually I did settle in and um, kind of like what Amy was talking about um, when I was at Mercer, I worked also on employee experience research but instead of internally, what we did is we consulted for other companies, other organizations, and we helped them understand through research what their employee experience was and how to improve that experience if needed. Um, so I was there for five years and um, I started to miss though, I felt like I was missing something there. Um, for one thing, I wasn't able to do as much of the qualitative research that I really loved. It was more quantitative based. It was um, very survey heavy. Um, sometimes we would do some focus groups and interviews, but it wasn't as much as I wanted. And one of the reasons I love qualitative research so much is because you get to connect um, with real people. You get to see them, you get to talk to them, you get to observe them. And so I was really missing that. And I was also missing 
it's like I knew I wanted to apply anthropology to solve real world problems, but I was missing kind of that deeper academic discussion of things. And, um, you know, I, I really loved that in grad school and, and undergrad as well. And so um, I was able to make the shift over to a smaller consulting firm, which is where I am now at Elite Research. And it's been a much better fit for me um, because um, basically I work with clients all across um, the spectrum. So I work with, um, and I'm talking specifically about elite research right now, because I also work at uh, Texas Women's University, but um, I work across a wide range of industries um, from the nonprofit, corporate, health, and academic spheres. And so um, for me, I feel like that really scratches that itch because I'm able to work with a lot of different clients in a lot of different areas. Um, when I want to get really deep into the methodological stuff, I can work with academic clients. Um, when I want to feel like I'm really helping like improve people's health or something like that, I can work with my health clients or nonprofit clients. And then my corporate clients, um, you know, provide some really interesting projects to work on as well. <clears throat> and so I, I feel like it's a really good mix. Um, so I help clients uh, with all stages of the research process, including design, data collection, data analysis, and reporting. And my work often includes program evaluation, grant development, training others on research methods, and um, manuscript, manuscript review. Um, but it's all with an emphasis on qualitative methods. So this gen generally involves trying to understand people's experiences about something at an in-depth level using non-numeric numerical data, um, such as observations, interviews, focus groups, and other audiovisual sources. Um, some things that I love about my job are that I get to work with a lot of different clients from different fields. And that means I get to become immersed in the topics of their research. And so I'm constantly learning new things. I feel like I'm constantly being stretched um, to learn. And sometimes the stretching is a little uncomfortable, but I'm always glad that I've done it. Um, I also love interacting with research participants and learning about uh, more about their experiences and perspectives. Um, and I enjoy encouraging and empowering others to learn how to be stronger, more confident researchers. Um, and then I also love that much of the work I do has the potential to improve people's lives. At Texas Women's University, my work is very similar, but my work there is focused on advising faculty and students on their qualitative research projects and manuscripts. And I'll also add that I often work on mixed methods projects as well, um, where I will drive the qualitative side and then a statistician will work with, uh, you know, will be paired together and they'll handle the quantitative side. Um, so to get a better sense of what I do, I'd like to share an example of a project that I worked on recently. Um, so this project was an assessment of patients and staff experiences participating in a grant funded health program. And it was designed to connect vulnerable populations to different resources that could help improve their health. So an example is um, one of the main ways that they would try to connect patients to resources is they would um, they had to be presented at an emergency department or they had to present themselves at an emergency department. Um, I think it was three or more times in a year that would automatically make them at least at the first point eligible. Um, and then they'd be screened for some different things that would um, designate them as being a vulnerable population. Um, and they would be paired, if they were eligible, they would be paired with a case manager. And then the case manager would connect them to um, all these different resources using a very specific tool that was designed for this program. And these uh, resources would be things like um, connecting them to food pantries, connecting them to transportation needs, um, connecting them to, um, let's see, it's been a little while. Anyway, you, I think you get the idea. Um, but the idea behind that is that there's all of these things um, that we, we sometimes refer to as social determinants of health that feed into a person's health status. It's not just, oh, you know, are they eating or, you know, are they, are they getting enough sleep and are they eating right? Um, but it could also be, do they have the transportation they need to get to the doctor appointment? Do they have um, even access to food? Do they live in a place that um, doesn't have any grocery stores nearby? Um, things like that. And so that was the point of the, the program. So then this organization that had implemented the program hired my firm to conduct the evaluation. And they wanted to understand what was working and, wasn't, and what wasn't working from the perspectives of patients and staff. They knew some things weren't working. They knew that they had a lot of patients dropping out of the program early, and, but they didn't know why. 
And this is a perfect uh, example of um, a situation that would be really good for qualitative research to come in and help us understand that because qualitative research is very useful in exploratory situations where we don't know a lot and we need to know more. We don't even know enough to ask somebody something on a survey. And so um, the way that we started, we, ban we began um, requesting relevant documents from the client. We, we met with the client multiple times to gain a deeper understanding of the program. And then based on this information, we designed focus group and interview guides. And then we piloted them with people who met the inclusion criteria for the samples we'd be collecting from when we did the actual study. So it's basically kind of a test um, to make sure that our um, instruments are appropriate for the, the populations that we're gonna be using them with. The client initially pushed back on us um, for piloting or testing the guides because they thought it, it would add an unnecessary cost and unnecessary time to the project. But thankfully they ultimately relented and it turned out to be a really good thing because um, when we were piloting, um, we found that the program terminology being used by the upper management of the organization was not the same terminology being used by frontline, frontline staff and patients. So in the pilot, they would often say, I don't know what you're talking about when I would ask them specific questions about the program because I was using the terminology that upper management had given to me. Um, also, it turned out that sometimes what upper management thought was part of the process in the program was not actually part of the process. It's like it was like, you know, at the very top of the chain, it was decided like this is what it should be like, but what was actually happening was not that. And so piloting the interview and focus group guides was an important step in making sure we were using native terminology for the groups and that we were also asking the right questions about the process. Once we find, uh, finalized the guides, uh, data were collected through seven focus groups and 40 semi-structured interviews um, with patients who successfully completed the program, patients who did not complete the program, social workers and program staff members. Um, focus groups and interviews were available in English and Spanish to accommodate those who preferred one language over the other. And then detailed observational notes were taken during data collection and field notes were recorded afterward. And we did some direct observation of staff and social workers with patients and compared what people were saying they do versus what we actually observed them doing. Um, we then transcribed all of the audio recorded data and uploaded it for analysis into Invivo, which is a qualitative analysis software. And then we used a thematic analysis approach to organize the data by emergent themes, and that helped us answer the study's aim. And then we provided a detailed summary report that we delivered to the client that summarized the experiences of the participants of the program segmented by the different respondent groups. So then um, the client then had concrete answers about what participants were saying they thought worked and didn't work about the program. And then they had that information, the information they needed to make changes. Um, I'll say that um, this is where my influence stops. You know, it's like, there's all this great potential information that they could use. Um, it doesn't mean that it always is used. Um, and so that can be a frustrating part is I like to feel like I'm part of, you know, some, some change and sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I should also note that even though I led this project um, and did much of the work, I was part of an internal team that, you know, we worked together and um, I did a lot of interfacing with the client team, particularly upper management and their appointed project manager. Um, and this presented some challenges because the client didn't always accept our recommendations um, for best practices during the project. And this resulted in some things not going very smoothly. So just an example, um, the client was in charge of securing the locations for the focus groups. Um, but against our recommendation, they scheduled the patient focus groups at a building that was not close to where any of the patients lived and it didn't have access to public transportation and so, or close access. And so, you know, the patient sample consisted of vulnerable populations, many of whom transportation is an everyday issue. Um, so this resulted in low attendance at some of the focus groups. And so I mentioned this just because there are a lot of details that go into the type of projects I work on. So attention to detail is extremely important, um, but I don't always have as much control over everything that happens as I would like. Um, and I never work completely on my own. So being able to work with others and deal with unexpected challenges is a part of the job. Um, so just a little bit more about um, how anthropological training is relevant to my work. So I think it's very relevant to my work um, because anthropology involves understanding cultural meanings and patterns of human behavior. And my work consists of helping to answer questions and solve problems 
that involve people who are part of a cultural context. Um, I use methods used in anthropological research, such as observation, field notes, interviewing and focus groups, and I draw upon foundational anthropo anthropological concepts in my work, such as cultural relativism and holism. Um, as far as what I um, see anthropology giving me an advantage in, in my work, um, I believe my anthropological training gives me an advantage for um, multiple reasons, one of them being this idea of cultural relativism. Um, being able to suspend my judgments and assumptions of a situation or cultural practice until I understand the context more fully and not using my own cultural standards to understand it um, has been incredibly useful. Um, from my first experience doing field work through BYU's field school in the Western Highlands of Guatemala with Dr. John Hawkins, I learned that things are not always as they appear and that often more information is needed to truly understand. So this mindset, which continues to, continued to be reinforced in me throughout graduate school and beyond, has helped me be a less biased, more neutral and open researcher, which I believe results in better quality research. And this mindset has also helped me guide other researchers and clients in this way of thinking. For example, um, every research project or study um, should have, you know, whether it's a formal academic study or a program evaluation, it should have a research question or aim that drives the focus of the research. So the wording of these questions or aims is very important. And I often work with clients who suggest wording for these questions that reflects a bias or assumptions unknown to them. Um, and if they start out with biased or assumptive questions that can affect the quality of the data they collect in the rest of the study. Um, another um, part of anthropology that I believe gives me an advantage in my work is ethnography. So the anthropological training I received in ethnographic methods taught me multiple valuable things that I use in my work, including careful observational and interviewing skills, recording field notes, strict attention to detail, and ethical considerations. As much as I learned about these methods in the classroom though, and in textbooks, the most helpful way that I learned these was through doing them through actual research projects. Both in undergrad and grad school, in field school, class research projects, and my applied thesis work, um, these were all very valuable and helped me really learn the methods. Um, when I got to grad school, I was surprised to find out that most of my colleagues had not had any actual research experience of their own before grad school. So I found my field school training as an undergrad at BYU to be very helpful. My training in ethnography also helps me take a holistic perspective in my work. So for example, when I'm conducting a program evaluation on people's experiences with a health program, it's important for me to keep in mind that their health behaviors do not stand alone in a silo, but are connected to culturally based health beliefs and economic, political, religious, familial, environmental, and other factors. Um, so yeah, so I believe that anthropology has, um, had, has really set um, a very uh, solid foundation for the kind of work I do. Thank you so much, Nikki, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so uh, some of you joined us uh, a little bit late. There was a mix up about the Zoom links, but we're gonna take uh, questions at the very end. So we'll uh, turn it over to our third panelist, uh, Michael Kladek. Uh, go ahead and take it away, Michael. Great, thanks, Jacob. Um, thanks, Greg, and hello to Amy and, and Nikki. It's so great seeing you all, and thanks for inviting me to join the panel. Um, I think my experience will be a little bit different because based off what Amy and Nikki said, I think I might be the newest one um, to kind of switch from um, academia or kind of be in, in industry. Um, so I finished my PhD in 2017. Um, and have just been in industry outside of academia now for a little over two years. Um, so my experience will be a little more um, narrow to, yeah, just, just kind of the last, last couple of years here. Because um, really when I was finishing up my PhD, I, um, you know, unlike Nikki or unlike Amy, really was, did not have kind of applied anthropology on my radar. I was definitely planning on staying in um, academia and was applying for um, academic jobs as I was finishing my PhD, um, just given the nature of the academic job market. However, it was not um, particularly friendly to me. Um, 
So after a while of trying um, on the academic job market, I realized I needed to uh, kind of expand um, my realm of possibilities and start looking outside of, of academia. Um, and at that time, that's when I started to uh, contact people like Amy. And so again, a big shout out to Amy. Thank you so much because her advice, um, other people I had spoken with who made a similar transition from academia um, to industry were just, it was just so, so helpful um, in kind of guiding me, um, you know, away from, from academia and, and into an industry job. Um, so I'm really grateful for, you know, all the advice and, and feedback I got, got along the way. Um, and I, and basically around that time, I, I began to realize as well that, you know, given kind of my, my background in anthropology, um, most recently in grad school, and then before that in, in psychology, where I was, um, even at that time, very involved in, um, you know, social psychology, experimental social, social, social psychology, and doing research um, and experiments and so forth, that what my real passion was, was around research. And my, my topic had changed so much um, in terms of what I was researching from undergrad to my master's to my PhD, I realized, really realized it didn't, to me personally, it didn't really matter exactly what I was researching as long as I was you know, conducting research. Um, and in particular, I think um, my experience at uh, University of Chicago and in comparative human development and anthropology really taught me that I particularly valued qualitative um, research. Uh, I, like I said, I had some experience with um, psychology and kind of doing, you know, more survey um, uh, based studies. And I, I came to really value like actually talking to people, you know, face to face, understanding, you know, individual people's kind of lived experiences. And so I knew I wanted to do something um, around that. So as I started to kind of um, broaden my radar in terms of what I was looking for, that's kind of where I, where I started. I was looking to see, okay, where can I apply, you know, my qualitative research skills um, in, in an area that would, you know, be meaningful and be important and of interest to me. Um, and so I just started scoping out any, any possibilities at, at all. Um, and I was really, really fortunate, um, I think, to end up where I am currently. Um, so I was uh, luckily enough to apply and interview and um, be offered a, a job where I am now with Clinical Outcome Solutions, um, which is a healthcare consulting company. Um, primarily, we, we consult with uh, pharmaceutical companies um, who are uh, either in the middle of clinical trials or, or going into clinical trials to test um, new drugs that they're developing. Um, and primarily what we do then is, you know, talk with uh, patients um, or caregivers of, of patients to find out, you know, what is most important to them um, in, in terms of treatment, what symptoms are most important to them, what issues around, um, you know, impacts on their day-to-day -day life, their quality of life are they experiencing because of their uh, disease that are most important for them for uh, these drugs to, to target and if they are part of a clinical uh, trial, like are they actually experiencing those changes that they, that they want to see and that are most um, important to them. Um, and so I, I think, you know, luckily the, that whole industry of kind of healthcare um, and uh, has, has just really changed so much in the last couple of decades that it has opened up um, a lot more possibility for qualitative research and, and a, a, lot, a much more value, um, increased value of, of qualitative research. Because um, it was back in 2009, I believe that the FDA um, published a, a guidance of including more patients in the development of, uh, of novel drugs. Um, and then more recently with the 21st Century Cures Act, um, and other kind of regulations around the FDA. The FDA is increasingly um, moving more towards this, what they call a, a patient-focused um, drug development um, kind of program where they want to see 
you know, increased um, participation by patients and caregivers themselves into the um, kind of drug development process, because historically, you know, there's always kind of the doctors and clinicians saying, you know, oh, well, I think, you know, X is, is most important when it comes to treating cancer or it comes to treating, you know, multiple sclerosis or whatever the disease might be. It was all kind of clinicians determining what's most important, what needs to be treated and not necessarily listening to the patients. Um, and so just in the last decade or two, that whole kind of um, paradigm has, has really shifted. Um, and so it's opened up the possibility for, you know, consulting agencies like, like the one I work with to kind of spring up and to, you know, bring in um, anthropologists and, and other qualitative researchers who bring that kind of skill set um, to, to bear on actually, you know, interviewing and, and talking with patients about what, what is most important to them. Um, and so I think in, you know, the, the work I do, that definitely is, you know, the, the advantage that, you know, anthropology um, gives me. I mean, even, even within um, my company, so it, it is a smaller company, I think we're around 40 employees total. Um, we do have kind of two kind of main groups. We have you know, more of the qualitative um, people and then more of the quantitative uh, people. We do do projects that are strictly quantitative, some that are strictly qualitative, and then kind of mixed methods approaches as, as well, um, drawing on both qualitative interviews, focus groups, as well as more quantitative methods, um, surveys, and, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, the, the backgrounds of the people coming in um, to our company and, and the teams are very diverse um, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, um, those who are focused on, on education, educational research, um, psychometricians, statisticians. Um, but I would say like, um, you know, on, on the side that I work on, on the qualitative side, we are primarily anthropologists and anthropologists and psychologists. And I definitely do notice a big difference between those who are trained um, with a background in psychology versus those who are trained in anthropology or sociology when it comes to interviewing. Um, and I think that is definitely where, you know, my um, anthropology training has, has helped a lot and um, really brought kind of advantages and, and un unique insights to the work that that we do, because I think you know myself and and others on you know my team that um, are trained in anthropology, right? We we kind of approach um, I think data collection and just research in, in general from a different perspective. Right? I think um, psychologists by and large are, are trained more to right, kind of collect data, right? You're going out and you're and you're pulling out information, you're pulling out data from people by having them fill out a survey or answer a question or two. I think anthropologists were trained to develop more of a relationship with our participants, right? We we want to be, we really want to understand their experience. We want to understand their day-to-day -day life. And so I think you know, myself and, and, and those who are trained more in anthropology, that's how we generally approach our interviews, right, of building a relationship and building a, you know, kind of rapport with, um, with our participants and, and seeing, you know, that whole kind of process as part and parcel of the, the data collection process. And so I think, you know, myself and, and those who take more of an anthropological approach to that, just we get much more rich data if you approach it in in that way you know kind of seeing yourself building a relationship with your with your participants and with your informants um and so i think that you know provides really unique um insights in into our work so just as an example of you know kind of what it is that that we do um and that i do on kind of a day-to-day -day basis so for example when the projects i'm working on now um, the, the client we're working with, they basically have um, two, two drugs that they've developed for uh, this particular disease um, area. And they want to see, you know, what sort of preference, if any, um, patients who are on these drugs have between um, the two treatments, 
And so to, to do that, right, we, we kind of started with um, just a, a literature review. So we generally, you know, do what, you know, you might do if, if you're writing a, a paper to begin with, just seeing, you know, what, what already exists out there in the literature um, about that particular topic, right? So we, we did a, a brief little literature review to see when it comes to this disease, you know, what do people say is uh, most important in the literature when it comes to these treatments, what, what are kind of the most common experiences, issues that people are having with these treatments, um, pulled out, out of all of that information from um, the literature. Um, unfortunately, we found most literature, um, perhaps not surprisingly, was mostly written by clinicians and doctors. And so it had a very kind of, it was filled with medical jargon and definitely from a clin clinician's perspective. Um, and so then we started doing, you know, interviews with clinicians themselves um, to kind of understand, you know, from clinicians' point of view, you know, what did they think was kind of most important um, to patients? What do they see as kind of the, the main pros and cons of the two treatments that um, their patients were experiencing? And again, um, perhaps not surprisingly, it was a lot of medical jargon that the clinicians themselves were kind of talking about and, and using. And so most recently now we've just moved to um, talking to actual patients um, themselves um, or caregivers of, of patients who are not able to do the interviews them, themselves. And it's been really interesting. Again, you know, I think, you know, bringing that anthropological approach and perspective of, you know, building that relationship with patients and really trying to understand what their day-to-day -day life is, is like um, has, has really, you know, opened up um, to really understand, you know, what exactly is going on, what exactly the symptoms are that, that these patients are experiencing, what are the issues that they are having with these two um, treatments that they're experiencing and why might they prefer one over the other is, is providing us with a lot of um, insights that we wouldn't have otherwise if we didn't talk with the patients themselves um, about, you know, why they might prefer one um, treatment over the other. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at right now. You know, my role in this is kind of all along the way of, of setting up, designing that whole research study, conducting the research itself, um, like so that we're in the middle of now. Um, we'll be continuing to analyze that data and then ultimately we'll also, you know, uh, write a, a report that we'll present to the client um, of the uh, findings that we've, that we've found and, and so forth. Um, I do want to leave some time for Amy before she goes, if there's any questions. So I was just gonna say really quickly um, on this last kind of point that um, Jacob had, had um, kind of prompted us with the things to discuss about how best to market anthropological, anthropological training um, that we've had if you do go on the job market. Um, one of the things that I did, I'm so grateful I did when I was an undergrad was, um, so when I was at the University of Missouri, um, it was basically called an honors thesis where you basically did an independent research project. Talking um, to Jacob and, and hearing Nikki, it, it sounds like this field school um, at BYU is something very similar where it gives you an opportunity um, to perhaps to do kind of an independent research study or at least be involved with in, independent research. Um, and I would definitely encourage people to do something like that you know, if you have that experience of putting together a research project on your own from start to finish, um, that gives you, you know, a really great project to talk to um, when you are interviewing. Or I know when I've done job interviews, a lot of times they'll ask you to do a presentation on something you've worked on before. And so if you have that experience, right, you have something to go to right away that you can do a presentation on to show you know, that you have um, developed a research project from start to finish and, and have examples of, uh, you know, difficulties you encountered and how you overcame those difficulties and so forth. So I definitely um, encourage people to do something like that um, if you have the opportunity. Fantastic, thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause for our three panelists, uh, digitally or otherwise. <laughs> um, very good. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, Nikki, and Michael. Um, I want to pose a, I think I'll throw out the first question because I want to get, and maybe we'll get Amy's uh, response first before we 
open it up more broadly because she's got to sign off here in a second. Uh, but I just want to ask, so it's very clear that um, I, I, it, it's very helpful and useful for all of you to give us sort of a, a thick or a rich sense of how your anthropological training factors into your work and how it provides unique insights to you as opposed to say colleagues uh, who are coming from other disciplinary perspectives. But I guess one of the questions I want to ask is, is anthropological training uh, explicitly recognized as such or valued as such by organizations? Or do you have to sort of like package that training in certain ways for either either employers if you're on the job market or clients if you're a consultant? Like, do you have to package that in certain ways? Um, and I guess another uh, related question, sort of what qualities or skills do organizations specifically value or look for that are part and parcel of an anthropological skill set, which is basically to say all three of you have given us a rich sense of how your perspective on how it's useful. But I guess I'm wondering from the perspective of the organizations uh, that you work with or work for or your colleagues and so on, do they recognize anthropology as valuable or how do you sort of like communicate that unique value? Um, and maybe we'll start with uh, Amy and kind of uh, uh, maybe work through in the in the same order you presented. And, and Amy, we recognize you got to sign off when you got to sign off. So yeah, I can stay a couple minutes over. Um, so yes, at the first job I mentioned I had in a research consulting firm, 100%. They recruited anthropologists specifically. It was like their one of their selling points. At Microsoft, we value anthropology. We value anthropological ways of knowing and seeing in deep qualitative research. We typically, when you know, we will put on a job description, um, you know, a minimum of a master's degree in HCI or anthropology or psychology or cognitive or experimental psychology, for example. Um, then with that said, there are key skills that you do have to translate over. You have to take your experience in anthropological training and be able to translate that into the ability to do deep, deep analysis, the ability to enter ambiguous problem spaces and make sense of them. You have to come, as Michael mentioned, with a portfolio of methodologies. So that would include, you know, you don't have to have quantitative methodologies if you're a qual researcher. It's helpful. Mixed methods, backgrounds are, are wonderful. And, um, you know, but we also have people who focus exclusively on doing deep qualitative ethnography, in-depth interviewing, um, you know, but you have to be willing to also learn new skills like doing usability studies, working in a lab, for example. But as long as we know that you've got the foundation to do that, then, um, you know, you're, you, you will be considered. The other thing is you do have to translate. So it's really important to build kind of a story for yourself or what you know it's cliche but what we might talk about as an individual personal brand so i'm a medical anthropologist in my research worked in the field of pharmaceuticals and mental health across cultures so that means i was studying biotechnologies in the context of culture now i'm studying other forms of technology in the context of culture and that becomes my differentiator. That becomes a story I tell when I go into different uh, meetings, when I go into different job interviews, whatever it is. Um, so I think crafting that personal story that really makes you stand out as unique, because people, uh, they recognize anthropology as important. They know it comes with a skill set, but they're not it's not like, whoa, an anthropologist. It's like, no, what can you do, <laughs> you know, here to help us succeed, you know, if you're in this role. So it's really isn't a form of translation and uh, really defining what your unique skill set is and educating people about it because they want to know more. Like a lot of engineers don't really know what um, anthropologists are, but you can explain it to them and they think it's really cool and, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, great. Um, Nikki, Michael, any thoughts there? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, at my company, I would say 
anthropology is understood to a very limited degree. Like it's understood that anthropologists can be experts in qualitative research, um, but that's kind of where it's, it stops. Like, you know, like they'll, uh, they, they understand that anthropologists understand culture, but when they think of culture, they're not necessarily thinking of like everyday like interactions with, you know, people that we see, they're thinking of like far away exotic places, that kind of thing. I would say in my experience, the, the focus is more on what can you do, like your skills. And so less about what your degree is in, um, but what can you do? So, you know, like I work with a lot of different people from, from different fields as well, including psychology and political economy and different things like that. And um, it really does seem like it's really very much focused on what are your skills? What can you do? What have you done? What's your experience? And, and then also what are you, like, do you have a willingness and eagerness to learn, to continue to learn? Um, <clears throat> I would say like when I'm working with clients, especially like my anthropology background very rarely comes up um, because I am uh, more packaged as a qualitative research expert or consultant. And so again, it, it doesn't seem to come into play as much, even though it is important internally for me and, you know, it's on my resume and things like that. Um, it's, it's much more about the skill set that I bring. Um, and so kind of echoing what Amy said, like, yeah, having a portfolio of research methodologies, um, I would really encourage people that are interested in kind of doing something similar to what I do is to do a lot of reading and um, really learn the different qualitative methodologies that are out there. Um, it doesn't just stop at ethnography, even though that was like a major focus um, in anthropology and grounded theory, like there's, there's a lot of other methodologies out there. And so the more that you know and understand, um, I think the more solid that you'll appear, you know, as a, as a potential candidate. Um, and then also I would say like emphasize your skills, but only the ones that you actually have, because I've had people apply for positions before where they list all these like really fancy methods. And then when I ask specifically about them, they don't know what they are. <laughs> They've never done them. So really focusing on what you do understand and what you can do. Um, and, um, and I would say also like an, another good thing that you can bring with you is um, learning um, these qualitative, if you're interested in qualitative research, um, learning um, a, a certain qualitative uh, or computer uh, assisted qualitative analysis software packages like InVivo or Deduce or Atlas TI or MaxQDA. Um, if you have like a couple of those on your resume and you really understand them and learn them, then like that can be a really big asset because it'll show that like, you know, you're invested in analysis and, and um, you know, you have those skills. So. For the record, we did not put Nikki up to that statement. We, we, we <laughs> strongly encourage our students to use Max QDA. Ah, uh, or okay. any one of the other ones, but we've kind of invested <laughs> in Max QDA around here, but uh we didn't ask her to say that ahead of time. No, I did not know that. <laughs> um, but I will say, because I use all of those different programs in different situations. And if you learn one or two, then like, you know, they've all got their little, little silly differences, but um, you're, you're, I think you're very likely to be able to learn another one. So even if it isn't the exact one that's used at your job site, like the fact that you have other packages under your belt, like shows that like you understand how it works, you understand the coding process, you understand analysis, things like that. Yeah. Uh, Michael, thoughts? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, I think my experience is, is very similar to Amy's and, and Nikki's. I would say in, in my company, I'm not really known as the anthropologist or an anthropologist, um, but that really goes for uh, everybody else, you know, those with a background in psychology or education, even their backgrounds don't really come up that often. It is much more, you know, what, yeah, what skill set, um, you know, you, you do bring to the table. Um, and so for me, yeah, it is more, um, you know, the, the qualitative background. It does come up um, every once in a while that, you, you know, um, because the work that we do is so much um, driven by the FDA and what the FDA's guidances um, are around uh, research and around health research. Um, that the FDA, for you know, the last several years has 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 generally focused on interviews 
and focus groups. Um, and so that's why, you know, our, our company then has largely focused on people who, you know, bring skills around being able to interview and, and do focus groups. Um, but it's been interesting just in the last year or so, the, the FDA is, is updating um, their guidances around this and they've started to bring in words like observation, not necessarily like words around ethnography or ethnographic methods, but kind of ethnographic adjacent words like observation. And so I'm really curious to see, because as those words have started to pop up, then you know, people in my community will be like, oh, hey, you anthropologists, you must be really interested in, in what they're starting to use words like observation, right? Um, and of course I am, because I'm like, yes, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to do more, you know, participant observation and, and really seeing, you know, people in their, in their day-to-day lives. Um, and so it will come up, you know, here and there, but yeah, by and large, it's not, um, you know, tied to a particular discipline, but yeah, as, as Amy, like you said, more kind of what, what sort of methods you, um, you employ. All right, uh, Amy has to take off. Thank you so much, Amy. We'll uh, let you go. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Reach out with any questions. I'm available on LinkedIn. Bye. <laughs> um, so a couple of other questions that have been, uh, so we'll just for those of you that joined us late, we're, we're going to go for about another 12 minutes here. Uh, uh, but we do want to. Uh, uh, I want to kind of turn to some of the questions students have put in the uh, chat. I think one of the quicker ones, oh, it looks like actually, Nick, you started responding to this, but if you haven't been looking at the chat, Quinn asked, uh, what are some of the other things to look for in job searches? So Amy responded, user experience researcher, design researcher, user researcher, and I think Nikki just said qualitative researcher. Uh, but anthropologists and applied anthropologists are uh, more difficult to find. And I was actually going to make a plug for that last one, ethnographer. I've seen in LinkedIn job searches and uh, some other places, oftentimes ethnographer is, which is a term that spans, you know, sociology and anthropology and even other fields. Um, but and, and yeah, anything else you either one of you would want to add to that as students think about how to sort of like what terms they ought to be oriented towards as they, you know, turn towards the job market. Any other thoughts there, Michael or Nick, Nikki? Um, yeah, I would just uh, echo what Nikki said with qualitative researcher. That's actually what I used um, when I was looking for positions as well. And it seems that, I mean, I, again, I'm an outsider to a lot of this, but it, just reading, having read some of these job uh, descriptions over the years, organizations who actually use the term ethnographer are more likely to have sort of like an institutional culture that values that particular skill set. Is that is that fair to say? That's been my observation. I think so. And this, but it is, I mean, it's definitely a buzzword these days, like ethnographer and ethnography. And I'm not convinced that everyone really understands what it all entails, even though it's very buzzy. Um, it's not always fully understood. Yeah. So Clayton posted a question very, <clears throat> very early on. Um, uh, Clayton, do you want to voice your question? Are you there? Maybe Clayton's not. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yep, go for it. Yeah, so my one of my kind of concerns with like going into applied anthropology would just be like, like in working and consulting generally would be like that I would be asked to consult on a project or something where like I have like deep reservations about like people, like the company or whatever. And I was just wondering if you guys have like encountered that at all. And if you have like how you deal with it. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so when I worked at Mercer, um, it never actually happened, but there was a short period of time where um, it looked like we might be trying to take on a client that was like um, a cigarette company. 
And like, I just like felt really uncomfortable about that idea of like helping a cigarette company, like better brand their things to get people to smoke more. Cause I just feel like that's not good for people. And so I remember thinking to myself, what am I going to do if we win this project and I'm put on it? And I like had decided like, I was going to like tell my boss that like, I didn't feel like ethically I could do it, but thankfully it never came up. And so <laughs> I didn't have to deal with it, but, um, Besides that one, like no other kind of like, you know, questionable companies have come across, you know, my way that have made me feel like uncomfortable to work for them. Yeah, I was going to say like, um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think when I started the um, position I'm in as well with the healthcare consulting company where we, all of our clients are, you know, a merely large pharmaceutical company is that that definitely was kind of in the back of my mind as well like oh you know do I do I really want to be helping these multi-billion dollar companies um but um yeah I mean the the I, I would say you know in the role I've been in like all of the clients all the companies we've we've worked for have all been you know really great to work with I really loved all the, the interactions I've, I've had um, with, um, with clients that we, that we work with. And it's really, um, I think what's helped too is like they themselves, you know, come to us because um, they see us as experts to talk with patients. And they really, um, they really come with this idea um, and this really kind of, um, this attitude of, of valuing and, and wanting to better understand, you know, what patients experiences are themselves and what is important to patients and how um, they either are helping patients quality of life or not. And if they aren't, like, how can they actually um, better improve um, patients quality of life? So I think those experiences and, and like the just having the opportunity, opportunity then um, in my day to day work and, and research that I do to actually speak directly to patients and, you know, hear from them how um, treatments they've been on have had, you know, profound effects on their um, day-to-day lives and just the ability to, uh, to go back to work, to, you know, to have uh, better relationships with their family, um, to do all these things that they weren't able to do before um, has actually been extremely rewarding and something that I really um, value and, and like about my work now is, is to be able to, to do that. Um, so yeah, I, like I said, I definitely had kind of reservations um, going in, but um, those reservations have definitely been quelled since, um, since being here. Thanks. So, um, so if you have it's any probably... questions, <clears throat> Sorry, Jacob. It's probably also worth mentioning that, um, you know, those concerns, uh, there's probably no career where those concerns are, are mute, right? Like, I mean, even in academia, those concerns are also present. So it's, you can't escape that concern. That's a great point, Jordan. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, please feel free to raise your hand digitally. Uh, if you don't know how to do that, I guess, you know, just uh, speak up. There is a question at the bottom of the uh, text or the, the chat here. Do you think that most people with anthropology degrees end up in research jobs? Are there other types of work that would be applicable? Uh, I mean, I could think of some of uh, the students that were students with me and Nikki when we were undergrads here, uh, you know, public health, law, dentistry. I mean, there's a, a number of uh, places that different people that we did field school with as undergrads um, ended up. And I think they, you know, talking to some of these people over the years, I think they'd say their anthropological training absolutely was relevant. But uh, any other uh, thoughts about, you know, anthropologically oriented uh, ways to apply anthropological training beyond uh, research types of positions? Any thoughts there, um, Nikki or Michael? Um, so, I mean, like, I'm thinking kind of more direct, like, yeah, like the people that you're talking about, Jacob, it's like, 
I think they value their degrees in anthropology, but then they went on, you know, in a different field. And I think they, you know, from what I've understood from them, they all feel like, you know, it's helped inform them. Um, within the actual like sphere of applied anthropology itself, there's a lot of different um, forms of applied anthropology. There's like, I mean, this is research, but like policy research, there's cultural resource management, um, there's like cultural brokerage where like you're kind of like the middle person and you're helping like different cultures come together and understand one another. Um, but I would say that most jobs that involve, that actually do apply anthropology or involve anthropology, um, it is res you know more research oriented, but it depends on the job you have as far as yeah. how, much, how in, in depth you're getting with your research and things like that. We have a large number of our graduates in anthropology who go on to get MPA degrees, so masters in public administration. And I think a lot of those people intend on doing like nonprofit development work, um, which may or may not involve research skill sets, I suppose. Um, thoughts there, Michael? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say from my personal experience, um, yeah, because it, because my interest has always been in research, that definitely is what I um, pursued for myself. And I was trying to think uh, back to others I, I know with a background in anthropology who didn't end up going to, into research. And yeah, similarly to what Jacob said, I, I think some of them did go into nonprofit, um, nonprofit development work or, or policy um, work. So looking at, uh, um, yeah, kind of think tanks public policy institutes um, yeah. in kind of DC area sort of thing. It's, 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 also, yeah, it's also probably worth mentioning, I, I've, I recommended a student that was uh, went on to uh, physical therapy school and uh, in, the, in the prompt that I got, they specifically list anthropology of one of the as one of the preferred fields. Uh, for people to have a degree in before they and and this is and Jacob, you know also about our 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 alumna uh, well alumni too that are in medical school. Um, I, I think PT, medical, uh, nurse practitioner, any of these kinds of fields also um, uh, would value and some of them explicitly the kind of experience you get as an anthropology major. So Riley, I think it depends what you mean by research jobs, because like I know a number of people, uh, you know, basically anybody who's doing consulting is going to be involved at research at some level, right? <laughs> and so I think it just depends on whether that's where you spend most of your time um, is the sense that I get from my friends and colleagues. But, um, but yeah, I mean, law schools uh, deeply value the type of analytic skills that anthropologists bring to the table. We have a lot of students who are quite successful in law school. And they, you know, talking to these students as they move on, the things that sort of like end up being particularly valuable would be the, like the, the, the analytic training that you get through our field school training process where you have to figure out what the proper question is and how a proper methodology and what types of evidence counts and you know proffering some type of uh answer to that question um and so you know basically any field that requires um a deep analysis i think is as amy put it um it can be a, a decent fit um so we have about a minute left uh michael or nikki any any closing thoughts you don't have to have them, but thought we'd give you the last word here. Um, just one other thought that I had, um, kind of going back to, you know, I talked about like, I work with a lot of different people, like I'm always on a team of some kind. And I think, um, you know, kind of the traditional anthropological training is the lone wolf, you know, researcher. And it just doesn't really work that way in like the quote unquote real world, you know, if you're a you're going to work as an applied anthropologist. Um, you need to be prepared to work with other people and work well with them. I would say that's even more important to me when I'm thinking of hiring somebody, as opposed to like if they have lots of research experience. Um, you know, if somebody doesn't work well with others and like is a know-it-all and like doesn't listen to other people and um, has kind of a big ego, then like that can be a problem. Like you need to be able to work well with people. 
um, and um, be agreeable and, you know, like you can still disagree about things, but do it in a collegial way. So. That's, that's great. Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, same thing. Um, like you said, I, yeah, I think that um, kind of working in, in teams was something different um, for me, but something I really valued uh, moving from anthropology where, yeah, I was the lone anthropologist out in the field um, to working in a team um, was kind of a shock, but a, a welcome shock and something I enjoyed um, kind of transitioning into. And I think the other kind of skill set um, that you definitely want to think about, you know, developing um, is just kind of more of a professional skill set of, you know, um, time, man time management, email management, all those, you know, sort of mundane um, things are, are important to, to think about and, and to develop as well as, as you have um, time and opportunity to do so. Um, and last thought too, is, as Amy said, um, feel free to reach out to me, um, contact me if you have any follow-up questions or wanna know more about what I do or how I kind of made the transition from anthropology. I'm in LinkedIn as well, so feel free to find me there. And is, is LinkedIn a decent way to reach out to either one of you if students have questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you both so much. If you'll all join me in giving uh, one more round of applause for our, our panelists. Uh, visual applause are acceptable over Zoom. But seriously, thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Nikki and Michael and uh, Amy. We already thanked her once before she signed off, but this has been fantastic. It's just invaluable insight to our students as they think about uh, potential options. I personally uh, suggest to students that whether you're heading, whether you imagine yourself as an academic or something else, it's important to know what the options are out there and and to hear from people who have actually, you know, trod that path and and been down that road and can offer some sage. Uh, advice and wisdom and perspective on experience. So we really thank the both of you uh, and Amy for giving us that today. So uh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.